Absolutely. It, it was a, that was, you know, one of the conscious business decisions that we made that we realized, number one, the allure of the British soccer coach only goes so far, you know, that there are lots of other world influences on the game. And we wanted to be able to bring those to, to the fore in our curriculum and, and how we position the, the coaching, but also the fact that, yeah, man, I mean, if we can do this in soccer, then we should be able to do this in basketball and football and rugby and hockey and all the other sports. We really ended up not being able to leverage that in the, in lots of other sports sports but we in fact we went a slightly different way we went uh, kind of horizontally and we looked at okay everything in this space what does every single club need and they all needed fundraising they all needed soccer kits they needed balls they needed goals they needed player education they needed coach education they needed parent education they needed administrative structure and they needed technology so we we kind of put our, our mark in the ground of okay From Coordinate Sports, it's The Drive Phase, a show about sports founders, leaders and experts and the stories behind their business journeys. Our guest this episode is Peter Arch, Vice President of People at Gymshock. Peter has spent more than three decades in the business of sport, founding and scaling Challenger Sport, taking advantage of every opportunity available to them. The company grew to become the leader in multiple soccer service areas in the USA. In 2019, Peter moved to the UK fitness apparel powerhouse, Gymshark. He's now responsible for setting up the new US headquarters in Denver and building out Gymshark's US team. He's put into work the lessons learned from years operating in the US to build another high-performing, purpose-driven team. During the episode, Peter talks us through the origins of Challenger and how he grew the business to work across every US state, the satisfaction he gets from impacting thousands of coaches' careers, one of which led to his new role at Gymshark. A great opportunity to hear firsthand how global brands are built and maintain values and culture at scale. So get a pen and paper ready to take notes from a pioneer and one of the entrepreneurs that helped to build the sector we have today. Enjoy the show. Yes, I'm really excited today to welcome Peter Arch to the show. He's the VP of People at Gymshark USA, working to shape the culture and build a world-class team at the brand's new US headquarters in Denver, Colorado. Peter also established a household name in our sector with Challenger Sports. Welcome to the show, Peter. Thank you, James. Delighted to be here. Me too, yeah. And I was just talking off the record. They already started with before we, uh, before we really got into it. And so much to talk about. And for those people, I guess, who don't know you, um, what we normally do is give a bit of a background, take you back to your childhood. And I noticed it was it's Worcestershire, was it? Or Bridge North? Was that where you kind of uh, born and raised? Bridge North in Shropshire. Shropshire, yeah. that's the one. Yeah, I, I know Bridge North. I've been there a few times, so friends there. Very good. Yeah, yeah. We, Bridge North was obviously uh, the hometown, Shropshire, the home county that I played soccer and cricket for. And my dad actually previously played cricket for Worcester and soccer for Shrewsbury Town. Right, that's the uh, connection. That's so the Worcester connection. That, yeah, that local uh, local home counties kind of connection there. So, in terms of sport, in your in as a child, you were you obviously very sporty. Did you, there was that from kind of family or just the area. I'm assuming with your dad being um, being like pro sportsman. You, Pretty competitive family. Very competitive, very sporty family. Also a product of our generation where, you know, everybody played sport anytime they could. You'd be up early in the morning playing before you go to school. You'd go to school. You'd have a break at 11 o'clock. We'd be playing soccer or football at the break. We'd run into lunch, scoff down our lunch and run out again. We'd be playing again. And then a, a short break at 3.20 when we had the, the afternoon break. Go home, rush your homework, and then out onto the field until you get yelled to uh, to come back and, and have your dinner and go to bed. It's I think it, obviously it's been well discussed and well documented, the change in culture and just how people don't have the ability to do that nowadays. I was going to say it's different, kind of different world now, the different distractions yeah. and, and fears, I suppose, from parents. Yeah, and I don't know if you've seen the recent Wayne Rooney documentary, just came out on Amazon Prime. You know, he speaks about it. That's all he did as a kid. He was out there and, and playing every moment that he got. So it's uh, it definitely will be interesting to see how we adapt. And obviously a lot of the, the great companies and organizations that you've had on your show are fill in that void they're providing an opportunity for people to get that play and that interaction socialization build the technical tactical physical and psychological elements they need to become a great player but it's now in a more organized way than it was when we grew up definitely yeah i mean in terms of yourself you 
through school and obviously outside of school, super sportsman. Going into university though, you went on and, and went to uni, studied there. Did that continue into university or was it purely academics at that stage? No, I, I hate to say it, but when I reflect back on my time at the University of Warwick, great university, wonderful lecturers, it was all about the sport and it was a little less about the academics. You know, so would, you, I, would you classify, I guess that would be, would that classify as like a classic jock or whatever it be from the US, US uh, terminology, is that it? Uh, without a doubt, yes. <laughs> I those values, I, I was captain of the football team, captain of the cricket team, played competitive squash did every sport anytime I could and it was a passion you know and, and obviously from my family it wasn't just my dad my mom played county hockey county tennis my brother was asked to sign for Shrewsbury Town didn't want to do that he went off to Nottingham to do law my sister played for England at hockey and England at cricket and my younger brother was in the, the local rugby club again chairman of the Bridge North Rugby Club so yeah it was sport surrounded us it's what drove us I think the, the one thing that I notice is different, though, in the US and the UK is over here, it's more aspirational. It's, oh, I'm going to play Major League Soccer. I'm going to go to the NFL. I'm going to go to the NBA yeah. as a kid. But in when we grew up, you just played. Just it, you, know, <laughs> you didn't think that this was going to lead to a college scholarship and a professional career. You played because you loved the sport. And, you know, the this tiny percentage who actually made it into the pro game, you know, more power to them. But it just wasn't a prevalent thought in a small town in, in Shropshire. You would, in fact, be considered a little bit big-headed if you thought, well, I'm going to go off and play in, uh, in the professional league. Well, that's one of the things I was going to say is in terms terms of obviously the sport one side but entrepreneurship and I guess the culture in the US is, is different and like when we go through your story we'll we'll see that it's kind of been a, a classic entrepreneurship story and taking opportunities but that culture change like US is renowned for that really encouraging it but I suppose in as you'd say back in in Bridge North if you said I'm going to be pro footballer the same way as if you said I was going to launch a business and multi, a multi-million pound business and scale it etc probably the same attitudes right and generationally, exactly. Back then, the careers advice was so poor. You know, it really didn't give you any any thoughts about doing anything other than what you see around you. You know, it, it really didn't open your eyes. We were at a grammar school, a very nice school, but, you know, it gave you these limited aspirations to, to look for. But uh, yeah, it's, it's very you, different over here. Because you went into teaching then, obviously, after, after uni. Is that what you wanted to do? Or was it more like that careers advice kind of sport, PE teaching? Was, would that be... I bet you I'm, I'm like many of the people that you've had on your show or many people who are listening to this, that you are very much influenced by great PE teachers, you know, people who become a, a you know, a mentor to you somewhat. And I had one at, at Bridge North Grammar School, a guy called Ron Oliver, who I'm still in contact with now, who just basically was that kind of person that I wanted to aspire to be. And so, you know, my thought was, okay, I'll go and I'll do a B. Ed. Honours degree at University of Warwick. I'll do PE and maths and, you know, it'll allow me to pursue my passion while at the same time, you know, I can pursue my sports at the university and coming out of that, I knew I didn't want to go straight into teaching in a school and an opportunity came along at Aylesbury College and I got a lecturer's job there for it was a year to replace the seconded lecturer. And that was that was wonderful because it really was a combination of coaching and teaching and working with with slightly older students. So it really gave me a nice challenge there. I'm really interested. I'm, I know you had a kind of a slightly different I guess it worked in a school with a slightly different approach or maybe ahead of their time approach for, for PE and school sport whereby yeah. it was, like, was it physical activity twice, not, not twice a week or more than that? Yeah, that was an interesting one because I, I finished my time at uh, Ellsbury College and I was playing for Ellsbury United at the time. So I wanted to stay local and I got a job in a gym and then I was headhunted by somebody who was opening another gym in Oxford. So I moved to Oxford. I ran the gym, the Temple Club for this uh, this gentleman. Wonderful, wonderful opportunity to really hone some business skills, a lot of gym and social skills. I had a membership of 350 members and we organized social events. We really built a culture of exercise and fun. One person who I was working with at the time, who also became a mentor of mine, he was a teacher at a school and he used to work out in the gym and he and I would talk all the time. And he said, you know what? I've had this idea about changing the culture of physical education in schools and the health of children. And I would want you to come in and write a health related fitness curriculum for me and come in and deliver it. And I want kids to do exercise every single day. And I measure it and see, you know, what we can do with this. And it just seemed such a, an exciting thing to do at the time. You know, managing the gym was great, but I knew it wasn't really going to lead to too much more. So I decided that, you know, I'll, I'll try the, the world of academia again. I'll jump back into the, the educational system in Oxford. And I did that for a couple of years. One feels like we're still trying to get that get, get that type of curriculum in now, right? Isn't it? Really? Probably, yeah, I guess it's probably the probably um, won't be far if we try to try to implement activity every day. Yeah, I think it'd go down well at this stage. 
Well, the, the gentleman, uh, the teacher who, who encouraged me, you may have come across his name on, on various uh, news articles or whatever. He was the talent scout who discovered Theo Walcott. It was a guy called Malcolm Elias. And Malcolm, in, uh, when he was in charge of Oxford Boys Schools, had an incredible kind of stable of, of players that he brought through to the professional ranks. Martin Keown and Mark Wright, and then Mark Jones, who I know uh, you've talked about on your show before. You know, they were all Malcolm's kind of players that he coached and then made sure they got into the professional game. And then he obviously went off and became a, a talent scout at Southampton and uh, did great things there. And uh, he's now at Fulham, but a, a wonderful guy and a, a real influence on my career early on. Okay, so skipping forward, moving to the United States, right? Back in, so we're talking, this is, early 90s 88 88 88, yep at that time making the move to the US obviously it's a huge move anyway but that would it was it kind of unheard of in your circle or was it it, um, something that a lot of people were doing at the time no it wasn't something that a lot of people were doing full-time a lot of people were going over to the states and coaching on summer camps right and the kind of the the pioneer of that was a company called uh, North American Soccer Camps that later became Major League Soccer Camps and I'd been doing several summers for them as a coach. And in 88, they said, look, we're, we're going to expand. We'd like you to come over and, and handle part of the East Coast of the, the US and be one of our directors. So I went to the, the headmaster at the school and just said, look, this, this is too good to pass up. I, you know, I love working here, but, and he, he was a, a soccer fan and he understood it. And, and he said, yeah, you just go with our blessing. So uh, I moved to the States and it, it, honestly, it wasn't a major culture shock because I had been over for many summers as before coaching, I actually did a, a university exchange program as well. I went to Eastern Michigan University for six months and I played on the soccer team out there. So I, I really knew what it was like. So for me, it wasn't a major leap. It was just kind of the next stage, next exciting adventure in my life to go over there and, and work for this company. Unfortunately, it didn't work out as as, as planned. <laughs> hoped that company ran into some pretty uh, serious financial problems. And what I was, was the making- role at the time? Was that so? It was leading their camps just through the, I guess, through the um, through the holiday period, or was it wider than that? That was back then. It was a very linear business. It was just summer camps, okay. and my job was to drive and go and meet the people who organised these large soccer clubs. Uh, you know, at the time you could have anything from, you know, 200 to 5,000 kids in an organized youth program. I would go and, you know, I would talk to them. I'd do a needs assessment and figure out how we could help them. And, you know, we would then do the traditional bringing coaches over on J1 visas and deploy them out into the summer camps. Uh, and my job was just to, to manage a region of, of those camps. And I guess at the time, participation angle but from yep. a professional point of view or was there was there a league at the obviously mls was no. prior to that there was not there was nothing pro league going on at that time because obviously there was, there was, no, league before. There, was right. there were some semi-pro leagues regional and the the national team was funded as a program and it was poorly funded the guys were you know trying to qualify for world cups and do all these great things on, on a real limited budget and the girls and the pro league didn't come around till 96 when Major League Soccer started two years after we hosted the World Cup over so, here. I was going to say, so what, was it a hard sell back then? In terms, that makes sense in terms of trying to grow the uh, the opportunity to that uh, kind of grassroots. Back then in, in the late 80s, early 90s, it was very difficult because we were not only trying to sell a new sport, which in effect was taking away great athletes from potentially the mainstream American sports. So sure, we had yeah. a lot of resistance from the football coaches, the baseball, the basketball, you know, anybody. Who, who had any kind of vested interest in traditional sports, and that included the media. There was very little support for soccer in the media. It was, you know, almost a, viewed as a something un-American. So it got, you know, very small coverage in the newspaper. You, there was no TV coverage of soccer. So it, and it was, you know, right at the, the start of the internet. There wasn't the ability of streaming services then. So I was in a bit of a, a void, and I, I still find that today. I lived and breathed soccer up until '88. And then there's about four or five years that I'm still coming across players and say, who the hell was that? I just don't recognize that. <laughs> so were you waiting yeah. for kind of trying to get newspapers sent from back home and get the, that get the was, um, was that what it, what it was like back then? Yeah. Yeah. The big excitement. Somebody come back in with a suitcase and they had uh, all the different newspapers to catch up on. So yeah, sorry, I, I cut you off then when you're talking about the, the kind of opportunity and there's a bit of um, obviously a bit of turmoil with the uh, finances of that initial yeah. employer. And then, so yeah, what, what was your next, next step? So you'd come up with a visa for them. And obviously that was 
is, does that mean you have to go kind of go back the well, that was, that, to exist though? Honestly, I remember it to this day. I was living in Connecticut, which is in the northeast of uh, the US. It was the middle of the winter and it was snowing. And I had to make this decision. I had one beer left in the fridge. <laughs> and I went and I sat on the front step and I just thought, there's no way that I'm going to go back now. I, you know, I've, I've made this leap. I'm going to make something happen. And I remembered that a guy had given me a business card three years ago when I was in Oxford. I'd oh. been doing a coaching session on a Saturday morning. And this guy was just running around the outside of the pitch. And after the coaching session, he came over to me and said, look, if you ever want a job in America, give me a call. So, oh, interesting. And kind of, thank you very much. Didn't think much more of it. Put the, uh, put the business card in my wallet. And then when we had this problem with my employer in, in Connecticut, I got the business card out and I called this guy and said, you know, you probably don't remember me, but you gave me this business card three years ago. And he said, oh, I remember you. Uh, he said, funny, you should call. We got some opportunities down here in Kansas City. So I basically said, well, I'm prepared to look at anything right now. Went down to Kansas City and he showed me these incredible indoor soccer facilities, you know, uh, 60,000 square feet. The new one was 75,000 square feet. It had two indoor soccer fields, a little bit like ice hockey arenas with boards, and then had multiple other sporting areas in the in the building. So this and, would have been this would have been state of the art, right? So they like oh yeah AstroTurf would have AstroTurf back then though. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And it was, you know, packed with not just kids, but adults who played. And they developed this high level of participation in adult recreational soccer, men's, women's, co-ed, and then obviously all the, the high school and all the junior divisions. That was, you know, the opportunity. I jumped at it. I came down. I helped run a few camps that were, were associated with this, almost like a counter-cyclical revenue source. You know, less people play indoor in the summer. So let's do some outdoor summer camps. And so in terms of these facilities, they're just purely community. Well, it feels like a community facility, but it's purely like commercial leisure facility that they private you know, enterprise. Build, building on spec to say, right, we think there's a market for this. And right. Yeah. Also, no, it's not tied to a club or anything like that. That's what I'm trying to Right. OK. Yeah, it was no support from a club, no support from the city, county, the state. It was it's a business. You do your business model and you project how many teams you can get playing an eight week season, how many are going to resign the following year. You model that out, how many referees you need, what the electrical costs, you know, what are all the other support services you can do in that building. And it is it, it, it was for me, a, a, you know, the start of a crash course in business. And one of the partners of that business, who is still a partner of Challenger Sports today, was the business guy. And he was very, very bright. So, you know, for the next 25 years, he basically taught me everything you would learn if I'd have gone to a business school. So, you know, I've come out of, out of education. I've had a little time in a gym, back in education, out in the camps. And then I moved to Kansas City and started working with this guy. And the plan originally was to duplicate these indoor facilities all over the U.S., they became very capital intensive and we found it harder to raise the money and get these buildings built. We built a brand new one in St. Louis, which was, you know, incredible facility. We added basketball and volleyball and a golf driving range and a few other things there, a gymnastics school in addition to the soccer. And, you know, unfortunately that didn't take off the way we wanted it to. It was hard work. And on a parallel time, I was working with the soccer camp program and we grew it from my first year of, you know, 35 camps using a handful of staff. And we grew and we grew and we were doing 100 camps and then 150 camps. And we had opportunities to spread out and take these out of Kansas City. And all of a sudden, we kind of realized this. You're, you're looking at the, the capital costs on that, on the current business and then the capital out there on the camps, right? Which really, I didn't realize quite at the time, but scaling a business where you don't have to tie up huge amounts of money in infrastructure and equipment and everything else, you're able to do it so much quicker. So after working several years on these indoor facilities and running the camps with a, another guy from, uh, from Wales called Alan Jones, we kind of realized that the camp part of it had an enormous opportunity. So we, myself, him, and a couple of other partners span off the campsite away from the indoor facility side. Wow. And we decided that, right, this is the model. We're going to grow this model. And we didn't quite have the vision at the time. We didn't realize what we would do with this, this entity. That, that was going to be one of my questions. Normally is one of the questions, but I said yourself and Alan, and then when you did made that decision to, let's say, see the opportunity there, the model looks great. What was that? I'm always interested in that kind of genesis, that origin story. What was the conversation like? Or the, was a lot of business planning going into that to say, look, we're going to do this. And I guess hierarchy, a lot of voices, a lot of people have a lot of opinions and stuff. So how is that all kind of managed? Did you sit down and say, right, I'm going to be in charge of X, Y, Z and someone else is in charge of it? Yeah, we had a nice blend because Alan and I 
handled the soccer side. We had a knowledge base and a passion and, and we knew what we want to do with the soccer side. We had two business partners who were very much the numbers people and business geniuses. One of the guys who lives in California was actually part of setting up a number of different businesses and a special event, which was, I don't know if you remember it, when Billie Jean King played Bobby Riggs in a battle of the sexes tennis match. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. It was an, an iconic moment in sports, in world sports. Was this uh, yeah. from St. Louis, was it St. Louis, something like that? Where did no, that yeah. take place? It was down in Houston. Houston, exactly. right. Yeah. Okay. And... Uh, this guy was a, a you know a big thinker. He understood scaling businesses. He understood really doing something with a small idea and how to ramp it up. So the first meeting we had, he said, "Well, we're going to need to grow. Who else are you going to need for this operation?" I said, "Well, I, I would love the guys who I used to work with at North American Soccer Camps." So I reached back out to them, and there were two guys there, Paul Lawrence and Derek Shaw, that had been in the industry for years, and we attracted them to Kansas City. Oh, oh them, back from Connecticut, then they've come back. Yeah, right, got it. Yeah, we gave them a piece of the business in the new business, which at the time was you know British soccer camps, which very quickly became Challenger Sports, and you know we brought them in, and we did have you know we we had an idea that we could grow this and we could do other things, but we didn't realize just how much diversification and expansion and, and changing and trying new ideas was going to be a part of our culture going forward. I guess that brand shift as well to Challenger, was that related to that sort of Challenger sport rather than soccer camp, British soccer camp? Is that because you saw, right, we could we could maybe replicate this across other other verticals, other sports? Absolutely. It, it, it was a that was, you know, one of the conscious business decisions that we made that we realized, number one, the allure of the British soccer coach only goes so far, you know, that there are lots of other world influences on the game. And we wanted to be able to bring those to, to the fore in our curriculum and, and how we position the, the coaching. But also the fact that, yeah, man, I mean, if we can do this in soccer, then we should be able to do this in basketball and football and rugby and hockey and all the other sports. We really ended up not being able to leverage that in the in lots of other sports sports but we in fact we went a slightly different way we went uh, kind of horizontally and we looked at okay everything in this space what does every single club need and they all needed fundraising they all needed soccer kits they needed balls they needed goals they needed player education they needed coach education they needed parent education they needed administrative structure and they needed technology so we we kind of put our, our mark in the ground of, okay, let's set up. <laughs> Integrate, like, um, vertically yep. integrated the whole the whole stack. Absolutely. I just wanted to talk, go back to just on the origin, because I know a great story for our listeners as well in terms of your first investor. You kind of touched on touched on it slightly. What was the story around that? So I know probably let you tell it would be better than, <laughs> better than me. Yeah. Well, the... the and did, you, did you need to raise a lot of money at the start? Was it something we, that you had to we, do? Was it because of the yeah, scale you wanted to go after? We needed money. We right. were bootstrapping the business. We needed people to believe in the story and the vision and to invest and give us working capital. Billie Jean King had been uh, an investor in another business that my colleague had started just at about the same time that we were doing the, the soccer coaching. He started this kids indoor playground company called Discovery Zone, which went on to be an, an international success before it didn't. <laughs> and went down the, down the toilet. But at that time, Billie Jean King invested in a number of these uh, Discovery Zone playgrounds and it was uh, she had great success and did very well out of it. So when we were looking for an investor in our company, we were put in touch with her. She flew into uh, Kansas City for a benefit tennis match. She had Elton John and Andre Agassi and a few other people there. And we were meant to just get you know 20 minutes in front of her just to tell her the story. So we met her in a hotel and we're there and we gave her the pitch. We said, look, this is where we're coming from. We see this as a great opportunity. The sport of soccer is starting to expand in this country like crazy. However, we also see it as a vehicle for teaching kids. We want to teach respect, responsibility, integrity, sportsmanship, leadership. We want to create a better group of kids who all enjoy playing sport, who are physically fit. And she really, you know, they resonate with it. Yeah. That message. Yeah. So, you know, she was immediately in and gave us capital that we're able to go. And, and obviously, once you have someone like that in your business, it gives you a little bit of kudos and you can get in front of other people. And we went and raised uh, enough to, to grow modestly. We saw the business model that was working well in Kansas City. Okay, let's try it in another city. We threw a guy out to put Andy Bennett in Atlanta and Mike Vincent in, in Texas and said, right, you eat what you hunt, basically. So <laughs> you've got to go out there and you've got to coach yourself. So you get into the coaching community. You've got to set up training camps and you've got to sell uniforms or kits 
to all these soccer clubs. So those expansion models were, you know, really prehistoric when you look at business today and they were working out of their apartments and, you know, we had visas for them and, and it was Classic, it's the lean, lean startup, though. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Just, just on a time, just to put a timeline against that. So you're talking, this is... Where early night. Early night, so this is before the World yeah. Cup, right? Because yeah. I'm imagining that, and maybe I'm wrong, I imagine you obviously you're scaling at the time. One question I did have was around the model you chose. So you've got that. The guys are employed, are they kind of equity partnerships or not franchise? You didn't choose to say the cl- kind of classic American, obviously, franchise. You didn't think, well, let's, let's roll out with franchise offering for the whole country and split the territories or all we did with this business because we really felt that the the quality of what we delivered was very much down to us how we recruited and trained our staff in the uk uh, Mm -hmm. and brazil in the end we brought brazilian coaches up and then how we handled them ourselves. we we tried to you know really create a culture where we took care of these coaches and they would be deployed into uh, a certain region and they'd rotate around the region and do maybe 10 weeks of coaching over the summer we didn't like the idea of giving up the control and having somebody else control the quality of our brand we wanted to make sure that you know this wasn't a you're making a sandwich and you're passing off to somebody over a counter franchise you know where there's very few points of failure for hours there were were a lot of points of failure that we really had to keep close control on so yeah we definitely didn't go franchise we gave equity to the key people in the company we gave stock options to all of our directors and we ended up bringing over about 90 full-time staff and we built a, a stock option plan for them but everything stayed company owned it feels like you're kind of you're gearing up and you're building up this this huge infrastructure for the World Cup to to land and then it's explosive growth. I'm just thinking that's in my mind. I'm thinking, oh, that might, that was, did it play out like that in terms of I don't, was it a plan or was it just fortuitous that USA have the World Cup and then interest spikes again and then hopefully it's explosive growth for you from there. Interestingly, there is something that exists in this country that does not exist in Europe or South America. There is a pretty big divide between soccer participation and professional game. The the, uh, the levels of participation are, are have been crazy good and expanding. You know, millions and millions of kids playing. The interest in the the professional game. It was almost like it's a special event that I want to be a part of. I want to say that I went to a World Cup game, and and, and then you know, two years later, the Major League Soccer starts, and it's you know, well, I have a passing interest in that, but I play soccer once a week i train twice a week i'm not going to go to the pro games at the weekend even if there's one in my town you know the crowds were pretty small when major league soccer started in 96 with 10 teams you know it was a hard graph they were still trying to build equity with the u.s public they were trying to find a way to really resonate and it was almost the opposite of what happened in europe if you think about the the history of the european game where you would have you know working class towns up north where there'd be a mill and the soccer team would be an extension of the the social club it would be all the guys in the mill they would support that so it was it meant something to their town to their parents to their grandparents it was this parochial thing that really was important to the the community over here it was you know the opposite it was oh there's a town let's put a soccer team in it and then all of a sudden that's meant to resonate and and be relevant to a town and it was it's taken a long time to build that kind of that love and that that recognition and you know it was it was always thrown out to us that oh when this generation they have their own kids it'll all change yeah, uh, really. three generations now and you know the league now is a lot stronger the professional league it's a lot stronger it's still not a high level watchable league that you would put on a par with you know the premier league or the championship but it, what it does have now is a strong following each city has a very loyal fan base and it's more of a tribal following it's not because they understand the sport they love the sport they think that what they're seeing on the pitch is beautiful and and you know is why they're going there they go there to wear the scarf and sing the songs and, and just be a part of it in terms of the scale for challenger you've gone from early days the first few sites what skill did, is it now obviously still running now what was what kind of skill did you get to at the peak or, or even today yeah interesting question yeah we at our peak we were running about three and a half thousand individual training camps during the summer so we had training programs in every single state and throughout canada and we were working with kids from as little as two years old on our little preschool program up to uh, you know high school and, and some college kids with the some of the businesses we brought in at that time we also were running a, a very interesting program that we would apply for a seasonal workers visa an h2 for staff to work on we call it the fall autumn and spring 
training academies. So we would actually subcontract these coaches out to work with other organizations. And we had 450 staff go out and they would work throughout big clubs. So before big clubs were actually having directors of coaching, they would employ people from us to be their quasi director of coaching. They, it's the, the knowledge base and the education they needed to train their kids. And obviously these American clubs, these American youth soccer clubs are very ambitious. They have a, you know, they're just like the typical American. We're going to put money, time and resources into our sports, whatever sport it is, we're going to, we're going to go for it. And we want to create winners, you know, so they wanted to hire the best staff. And we had these wonderful uh, young men and women from the UK and from Brazil. So we would deploy them out. So that was a big part of our business. We developed a tournament part where we would have a number of tournament venues throughout the year, a lot in our key markets in in Atlanta and Kansas City. But we had about 30,000 players come to those tournaments throughout the year. We had an international travel program where we would take teams overseas, mainly to Great Britain, Europe, and some South America. That got up to, I think we were taking about 600 travelers uh, across each year. And then we'd also diversified and gone into uh, the soccer kit business. So we uh, we manufactured our own oh, you, uniforms, kit. right? <laughs> uniforms. <laughs> yes, it was. Uh, it's, it's hard to say that word, but we developed our own brand and we uh, manufactured in Vietnam. We went out to market directly. We avoided having wholesalers, distributors, retailers, our staff who already had the relationship with the soccer club now we're able to go in and have this bag of solutions you know what is it that you need do you need competitive play do you need education do you need travel do you need kits do you need soccer balls do you need goals Mm -hmm. we became a, a complete supplier total soccer supplier to these organizations and at that time under armor saw what was happening what we were doing and pretty much in the u.s nike and and adidas control the soccer market you know adidas controls major league soccer it has a contract with the league so every team has to wear adidas nike has the national teams so they really are have got that sewn up so anybody wanting to come and play in that space and be a you know a major player in, in the soccer market in the retail market you you're having to knock down customers, you know, one at a time because there aren't the big organizations to, to take over. So Under Armour came to us and said, we'd like you to become our official distributor and all these relationships you have with these three and a half thousand clubs around the country. I was going to say that must be really, like, really um, beneficial for them to be able to just plug into that footprint you had across yep. the full network and just kind of drop into it and get that exposure. It was. It, it was something that we kind of realized had significant value as we built the company was the relationship that we had, not just with these clubs that we, we worked with, but for every one club, we were probably doing 10 presentations to other clubs. So when we go in now, when we're, we're spending all the time to call and to email and to set up meetings and to drive hundreds and hundreds of miles sometimes to meet some of these clients, instead of just going in and saying, you know, we would like to offer you a, a soccer camp for the summer. Now we're able to say, right, let's sit down. Let's really look at where you need help and how we can bring a service or a product to the table to help you do this so just continue to add value consistently what would you say the biggest challenge was would have been changing all the time but like when you look back day to day see a lot of our listeners are running running businesses in the space what were your recurring challenges at that scale i think the hours was a unique challenge and that was trying to work with the visas uh to be able to be the rules and regulations for for visas were changing Every year. Did you, um, did you have like legal counsel? Just, did you have lawyers on staff at that point? Probably the amount you didn't doing. have them on staff, but we had a very good legal company that we worked with in Kansas City. And then we also had one in Boston who worked with all of the professional teams who had right. just incredible experience. So if we had a, a really difficult challenge, we would take it up to him. But we were, you know, we were having to apply for, you know, over a thousand J1s and 450 H2s and then H1s, which are the professional visa for our full time staff. Mm. And after they'd had two H1s, we were paying for them to get a green card. So we employed a paralegal on staff to uh, to oversee the admin of that because it, it was a massive part of the business. And then uh, I guess that's because um, the models are amazing. Obviously, from the UK, everyone knows challenge. Everyone knows kind of the, the recruitment model and 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 also the the kind of conveyor belt of of motivated, enthusiastic staff who doesn't. If you're a football coach, soccer coach, who doesn't want to go to the US to coach? See, the model seems. It's almost uh, unbeatable, but then that challenge for you is like one point of failure, right? So if your visas aren't done on time, you kind of got you haven't got any staff. Is that what I said? Was, was there staff in the US that you were able to recruit, or was it just kind of this guy doesn't get over here by this date, then that camp can't run? Two or three years before COVID hit, 
we started looking at this saying, we don't think it, it's going to be sustainable just right. getting, continuing to get the visas just because the way the government was was changing the rules and really trying to stimulate employment in the uh, in the U.S. sector. So we started kind of mulling over the idea of recruiting internally in the U.S. and going out to all the colleges where there are, you know, there are thousands of young men and women from Europe working on the uh, or, or playing for these colleges. The hand was forced by COVID when yeah. obviously the uh, the flights were shut down, the visas were, were closed, the embassy was closed. There was just no way of getting anything with the US embassy. So this is after I'd left. The year I left, Alan and the rest of the team, they started on recruiting around the US and had good success. Year just gone, I think we had about 35,000 kids at camps which really was a massive success considering that everything had closed down for a year that, you know, it was a very nice bounce back. And we had coaches that we'd go into each region and the regional director would network with all the local schools and organizations and, and even with the local clubs who had coaches and offer them part-time employment for the summer. And that's the thing. I mean, I'm assuming I was going to say what's what's the biggest setback, but for the business, I'm sure it was it was COVID. But the demand doesn't go away, right? So it's just a just a set. But that's exactly what it's just a setback because now is where everything's free enough that the demand seems to be higher than ever and spiking again. Yeah, we are really bullish about what's going to happen in the future. The sport is going to continue to grow. It's actually there's an interesting thing that's happened to the sport. It's actually kind of almost professionalized where large soccer clubs are now starting to take over in, in each city and they gobble up and consolidate a lot of the smaller clubs. And these clubs now employ their own director of coaching and age group directors and a kit uh, coordinator and everything else. So now there is, uh, we're having to work harder, spread our, our kind of ourselves across the country even further and go to the markets where you don't have a club affiliated to a major league soccer team you know almost like a feeder team where they've got you know ten thousand kids now that are it's almost like creating a supporter base as well as creating a a, a coached soccer organization so uh yeah that opportunity is there also the we're continuing to look at tech opportunities you know every club is going to need online registration league management software a streaming educational element to that to be able to teach their volunteer coaches so that there's a an enormous opportunity there you know i, I think there's there was one thing that I would leave any job for tomorrow if I found it, and that would be a, a really cool fundraising opportunity because not only does every soccer club need fundraising, every youth sports club, boys and girls scouts, every school, and they all kind of roll out the same, you know, old age, selling trash bags, selling candies, <laughs> yeah. car watches and things like that. So keep your eyes open for some, uh, well, some yeah. Anyone there. listening as well, John. I was, was going to say, in terms of your growth, like really organic, but then you st it's just kind of a story of like seeing the opportunity, going for it, seizing it, and seeing all those kind of, I guess, nuances. So if you're doing the, you've got the camps, but then I'm assuming that you've gone into upper age group, lower age group, boys, girls, tournaments, all, all those. What was the, um, I guess, what would you say the makeup is of the of the whole organisation, if you were to break it down? Is it more, would you class yourself more as a apparel company versus a, service delivery does that make sense i don't know if, I, if i'm no no I, I get exactly where you're coming from and you know as we evolve we were very agile very quick to be able to seize an opportunity and we recognized we can't be brilliant at everything with a particular brand because you know what your customers see you do most of is how they perceive you so they saw us you know challenger sports these great camps there you would teach kids you know a fun way to learn soccer we'd have these incredible curriculum practices drawn up that really engaged entertained and educated kids in a in a very unique way However, that doesn't work for the older age kids who want to go on and play at college. So we acquired a company called Soccer Plus, which was owned by the coach of the Women's World Cup team, the, the famous World Cup when Brandy Chastain took a shirt off after scoring the winning penalty. Their coach was Tony DiCicco. Tony unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, but was a, an incredible business partner and is somebody that if you ask anybody at Challenger Sports, uh, he is one of the nicest people they've ever met in the game. And he had a, an advanced coaching program called Soccer Plus, which was goalkeepers and field players. And it was a really intensive training program, preparing them to kind of go from high school to play at college. So we, we would bring other companies like that in. We acquired a Brazilian coaching company called Tetra Brazil. We developed our own preschool market called Tiny Tykes and just continued to look. And, and the one thing that, you know, we are quite happy to say is, you know, you have to fail and fail fast. Try something, 
if it doesn't work, it's okay. You know, better to try it and, and go down that road and learn from it. You know, you either succeed or you learn, basically. And we did that. We would continually learn and we'd try a program and it didn't quite work. So we'd pull back on it and go in a different direction. But just having, not being bogged down in bureaucracy and hierarchy and decision-making. If we saw an opportunity, we'd all go around the, the business table, all the, the directors of the company. And, you know, within two hours, we could build consensus on what was the way to go. And you, you don't all have to agree every single time, but you do need to have consensus and you need to have a unified plan going forward. And, you know, it was, it, you were never kind of pointed at if something didn't work, it was okay, let's reset and let's look at the next opportunity. I mean, saying that as well and hearing all the, the journey, 30 years in building that, that business with the team, it must have been, I'm going to talk about the, the kind of Gymshark story as well. It must have been difficult at that point. And I know there's a lot behind the kind of, your story of how you ended up at Gymshark, but just, if we focus on like, I guess, leaving, it's got to be a, a really big, was it a big challenge for you or are you kind of ready for, ready to move on, if that makes sense? Yeah, I, I think the market was changing. It wasn't the same as it used to be. And, and you know, we'd had incredible success at what we'd done. We were becoming more of a kit company that was, you know, previously we were a coaching company with, who sold a few soccer kits. And now we really see massive opportunity in the kit side, not just soccer, but baseball and volleyball and basketball. And we've also bought a sublimation plant over in Haiti where we can actually now do really cool designs on the uh, on the kit ourselves. So that was really uh, skewing the business a little bit. I think I probably would, would still be there today if the Gymshark opportunity didn't come along. Um, you know, this was a, a unique thing that happened in my life that, uh, you know, somebody who I employed back in 94, 95, 96, he later became the Gymshark CEO. And it was because of my working relationship with him and personal friendship with him and, and his wife that I invested in him, he, you know, I was kind of a mentor to him early on. He was just somebody that we spotted had this incredible work ethic. He was a Geordie, he had the charm, you know, was great at sales. And we just sensed that he was going to go and do something. For is it, so this is Steve Hewitt, right? Yeah, this is yeah. Steve. And he and he's, um, so when he's come across to uh, Challenger, is that as a coach at that at that time, or as a just coach, came over the classic like, coming over for summer, yeah, classic, on the summer, yeah, and then we offered him a full time job, so we were his first job out of college, mm -hmm. and you know he was over there. His girlfriend came over to stay with him. She became the nanny when my kids were born. Then she unfortunately had to leave to go and look after her parents back in the UK. Steve decided to go back there, worked for Paul Stretford for a year with the uh, agency, and then went off and did a number of different things. And, uh, you know, he became head of sales for Europe for Reebok and really became a very, very sharp businessman. In addition to all these other soft skills that he had, he now was getting polished in, in really running a business the way uh, Reebok runs businesses. And then so, I guess also with your, I mean, this is kind of, does feel like synergy. So you've got that that relationship and we'll touch back on it. In, but in terms of all the opportunities we've just spoken about, and I know there's probably huge, loads more that's the um, experiences, but obviously the team were expo <laughs> exploding and your manufacturer fully integrating the, the distribution, Under Armour coming in and, and partnering with them. A lot of kind of your career, I suppose, is is um, involved with or, or is linked to that apparel side as well, right? So it does feel like it, it's a... Like it it's is, kind of, but it's... It's not the reason that Steve wanted me on board because they okay. have incredible specialists. The, the Gymshark business model is, it is really specialized in product and in planning and in merchandising and paid media and managing influencers and all these other things. Good. Steve basically came to me and said, look, we're having a lot of success in the US. 50% of our revenue is over in the US and we really want to take that market seriously. It's the biggest athletic leisure market in the world. If we're going to take it seriously, we need to have a presence over there you know the us you've built a culture from the ground up i've seen you do it i've seen what it was like at challenger we were purpose driven we had a mission we weren't working for a paycheck mm. we were working because we believed we could change lives we could make kids fall in love with soccer and we could help make them become better people and he said look i want a, an office culture in the us where people they've got to feel like it's christmas eve every time they come to work it's, they're just going to come in and, and you know they're going to love being in the office i want it to be the place that everybody wants to join nobody wants to leave where people can become the best version of themselves so that's, that and that's got to be important to them in terms of that it's a british company right so they they, they want they want to have that kind of british attitude but that culture british company someone you could have easily 
I guess out, not outsourced it, but brought someone from the US to set up the office, which might have felt totally different to the to headquarters back in Birmingham. Right? Yeah, the, the founder, Ben Francis, who obviously is a, a really interesting story that you should absolutely uh, follow up on and get him on your show. Yeah, that'd uh, be good if you can get him on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A young man who just, you know, had a vision, had a skill set, saw an opportunity in the market and surrounded himself with other people who believed in it and grew this business at a time when the internet was just kicking off, when influencer marketing really wasn't a thing, but he created a version of it and he caught lightning in a bottle. So as he grew this company, you know, he had people that he went to school with in, you know, the Bromsgrove area, and he had other people that he knew and they grew organically. And they had this incredible family culture that was built in just absolutely right in the middle of gym shop office was this feeling that you're, you're all in it together. Yeah. And he always said that he would rather lose part of the company than lose the culture that he built up. So that was my kind of remit when Steve offered me the job. It was the job is to, you know, number one, find a city in the US. We don't know where to put the office. So find us a city, find us a building, and then help us build a staff and create a culture that reflects the Gymshark culture in Solihull. Curious, a couple of questions. Obviously, you've got, you're trying to replicate that culture from scratch, but also like a ridiculous pace. I'm assuming you've gone from zero staff or one staff. Was it just yourself to start with or how, how did that? And then hundreds of staff. So that's got to be a really big challenge. I'm interested to, to hear how you, how you go about that. What's, what's the first step for that? Yeah, it, it was. I, and, and at the same time, doing it while COVID was a thing as well. So Sorry, a lot of yeah, our, I forgot about that one. Yeah. That's in the little thing on top of it. A lot of our hiring has been done virtually, you know, and we, you know, fair play to that. We have a, a talent team, three very talented young ladies who are recruiting and basically putting together an incredible group of people here. And again, we've got the luxury. We, we're not growing like Gymshark grew in the early days in Solly Hull, where you're just kind of going from a little operation and you're bringing your friends in to help and family members and you're growing organically. We've gone out and we have purposefully sourced great people for uh, specialized positions. We've got a senior VP from Adidas who's uh, in charge of our finances. Uh, we've got a number of staff from uh, Lululemon, from North Face, from Under Armour, Nike. We got the VP of marketing from Nike, who also worked at Beats by Dre, Apple and Disney. So we have got just a stellar staff over here. And it, it's been over, you know, the last two years, we've just put it together slowly. And it seems like, you know, yesterday, but it was just incremental hiring. Every month, there'd be three, four, five, six, seven more people, you know, and, and then all of a sudden you turn around and the office is now full. And we've got this incredible... Uh, office that's 39 floors up staring out over the Rocky Mountains. It's a 25,000 foot open span office that has been designed by the people who designed all of the Gymshark offices around the world. So it has this really cool, accessible feel where nobody has a private office. You are all mixed in together. And if you want to talk to the president of the company, you can walk across and, and talk to Henry. If you want to talk to the VP of brand, you can go and just chat to Sinai. And it is part of the kind of the tenants, the values of what makes Gymshark, Gymshark. It is this accessibility that, that you know, we, we find a way to make everybody feel welcome. We provide incredible support for them to grow in their positions. Uh, we have three people who are dedicated to performance, which is learning and development. So all they do is they provide the tools and the training for everybody to become better at their personal and professional skills in the office. And we really do have a people-centric way of, of running the business where I found it ridiculously refreshing and, and a massive surprise when I first flew into uh, to meet the Jim Sharp board in Solihull. And I'm sitting around a table listening to one of their board meetings and it is all about what's right for the customer, what's right for the employee. And if we get that right, the money will come. Whereas, you know, in, in the traditional US business world, you're, you're always looking at the bottom line and then trying to reverse engineer the business to make a bigger margin and to be able to make more money for your shareholders. It's And I know it, it will change as we grow. Things will will evolve and change. But I'm I guess that's got, to, that's got to be one of the reasons why like, to be able to attract um, the talent that you spoke about. So people coming from from Nike and Adidas and you, because they're going to be the next, your competitors now, I'm sure that, that's the level Jim Sark's at. That has to be a huge win for you to be able to, to attract them, right, into the business and help build out the team. Massive, yeah. It's defined us here. People are, are starting to realise, oh, my God, they got this person, this person, this person. There's something very special going on there. And I think the brand right now, obviously, we're, we're quite a hot brand uh, for people who know us. Mm -hmm. Anybody in the, the fitness world will know us. 
However, the rest of the US hasn't got a clue who we are. So we have got a massive opportunity to scale this business by increasing our brand presence over here. And that's, you know, that's why we're bringing in some brand experts from all these other companies to really help us talk to the rest of the country. Yeah, definitely. And I guess I really want to touch on kind of why Denver, the decision, kind of decision process around that was. But are you looking at the expansion across the US in terms of, obviously for yourself and the team, building that up? You're going after specific sports, like you said, the fitness industry knows Jim Shah, but is it like right? We're gonna. You said earlier on, Adidas own football in the US or soccer. Is it? Are you looking at that's all right? We want to target a specific sport that we think is a good a good fit for the brand and, and go after that. Or is it? Is it more of the kind of lifestyle athleisure? angle that you're going down? It's a great question. And it's one that we we deal with every day. The space that we want to own is the gym, but we want it to be the place where the sportsman, the NFL star, the basketball player, the football player, he's in the gym on his off days wearing our gear and is a part of our community. And it's something that we've had to educate the UK staff about a little bit is the influence of sports in this country is massive. Mm. It is, you know, it, it exists in a whole nother plane. Football is football in the UK and cricket and rugby, and they have, you know, passionate fans. Over here, sport is so involved in so many different things. You know, it, it is, in addition to being entertainment, it's a massive financial business, but also it's tied into academics. I mean, you play as a young child with a thought of maybe getting a scholarship to a university, which, you know, these universities could cost you 60000 a year to go and study. And, you know, there's quarter of a million dollars if you haven't got a scholarship that students often come out of college with a ton of debt so it, it's a way way forward in there and it just it's a way sport weaves itself into tv and entertainment it is such a mainstay of, of the u.s culture that we realize we will have to play in that in that pool we're going to have to find a way to to make sport relevant to gym shark and for us to use sport to promote our brand yeah and still maintain the kind of brand brand authenticity as well which is really exciting i mean a couple of logistic questions for myself in terms of you've got the office there in Denver is that kind of all of the US operation comes out of Denver like distribution everything like that and I guess probably leads into into the decision of why to set that up and that was that was what you were tasked with initially right yes like, find us a location right that's not yeah a few areas to pick from right well if we start with that one I, I basically did a deep dive into all the major metropolitan areas in the US needed to cross-reference them they had to have a direct flight to Heathrow I had to have a direct flight to LA and to Toronto which is where we knew we were going to put two of our warehouses and then there were a whole bunch of other factors that I needed to look at and if you kind of fast forward and you, you look at Denver it is a, a unique city who has attracted some of the biggest names in tech to move here from California recently Google have put a massive facility in here bringing tens of thousands of jobs Twitter to have just taken six floors of a building uh, not far from here. Facebook have got a regional office here. Slack have got an office here. Home advisors and, and the, the list goes on. Denver has attracted them because, you know, some of your, your listeners will know they may have been out here. It is one of the most beautiful cities in North America. You know, we have the whole of the Rocky Mountain range on the west side of the city. And currently, you know, they're snow capped and they are, it's like being in the Swiss Alps. And you're a short ride away if you, uh, you know, if you want to do skiing or snowboarding or walking or hiking or biking. It's just active lifestyle, right? It's the culture. There, it is part of the Denver culture is mm. people having this work-life balance. They really understand that, yes, I work hard, but also I've got to enjoy the incredible nature and the incredible uh, facilities that we have here to go and, and do recreation at the weekends. And you'll see on a Friday afternoon, just a massive line of cars heading up to the mountains. And they'll spend the, the weekends up in Vail or Aspen or Breckenridge uh, and then, you know, back again here and back in the office. And it's something which is obviously you can attract and retain talent with something more than an office. You know, it is the lifestyle here that is people are looking at saying, wow, this is just a really cool town to be in. Touching on what you said there around, um, obviously, those huge, huge um, companies coming in from the tech side. I'm sure you, you're employing and recruiting tech talent as well. That's got to be a challenge going up against those guys for um, recruiting, especially tech talent anyway. So it's going to get, it's getting, I guess, the place to be, but that could be, have some, some drawbacks as well from, from the competition side. Yeah, we, we've got a slight advantage there that our tech side is still handled in the UK by the parent company. And oh, they are just sure. ramping up. I think we had 90 members of staff a year ago. We're going to have 230 in our tech team this year coming. We have a small tech support team out here. 
but we do, we compete for talent and these companies are driving wages up. You know, they're able to offer, you know, very lucrative packages. There's a VF Corporation, the parent company of North Face, uh, who also own Timberland and, uh, you know, a whole host of other companies. They move their corporate office right down the street from us as well. So they've got a large staff there. And, you know, it, it's good news and bad news. It's uh, it's great to have those companies to compete with. You know, a lot of them are very well-established companies, but also the good part is we are kind of the new kids on the block and we offer this very agile culture where it's not steeped in layers of decision-making. And It's not uh, that corporate, yeah, that old school corporate culture. Yeah, well, it definitely validates your decision. <laughs> Everyone keeps moving in and shows that you've made the right choice. We've kind of touched on what's next for Jim Chark or, or kind of the, the rollout. But until just on the people front, what's the numbers you're looking at? So obviously scale, I think it's two, is it 200 plus employees now in the, in the US. 200 was the original target for the US uh, within a couple of years. We're, we're up to 117 now. We'll be 150 by July and then we'll grow again. And that will pretty much max out this floor, this 25,000 square foot floor, you know, and at that point we'll need to get ahead of the game and think about how we're going to expand. There is no plan to put multiple offices around the country you know we that was going to be my question would you be looking for another hq or like somewhere else one of the coasts maybe we don't have relationships with shops and, and distributors so we don't need to be out there working those That's relationships true. you know with the dick sporting goods or you know working with ebay google whatever so we are just a very much a direct consumer brand People will go on our website in, you know, hundreds of different countries and they will purchase the product in the US. It'll be shipped from California or Pennsylvania. We have two warehouses there and in Canada from Toronto. In Europe, most of it comes out of our Belgium warehouse. And then we just put a warehouse into Australia as well. You're switching gears a little bit, Peter, in terms of not personal, but just kind of your approach. So you're building up the team and rapidly growing. If, is there any kind of philosophies that you've developed over the, your years in business or like, and it's almost been like a, I guess, a dynamic MBA you learned on the way as you've gone and all the experiences and stuff. Anything that you always kind of would share or a philosophy that you hold, hold dear to your approach to, I guess, leading and building a team? Great question. And it has been like a, a living and breathing MBA through the original challenger experiences. That's, yeah, that's then, what it felt like as you talked to them. Yeah. Stuff. And then the, the recent, the last few years, last three years with Gymshark has been like a new age business education because of the way that the business is run. It's, uh, it is very different to the traditional way of business. You know, it is very digital. It's very specialized. However, my, my kind of underlying business philosophies have always been people-based, even sometimes to the, uh, sometimes it conflicted with what we would want to do as a business. I would often, I'd speak up and say, I prefer we don't do that because of the impact it'll have on our staff. Or, you know, I don't see that this will actually help the customers do what they want to do. And I've, I've kind of been a, a cheerleader and a team leader for the staff throughout my whole life. Uh, when I came to Gymshark this year, you know, we'd, we brought a whole bunch of people in from other cities. And in November, we have this big holiday here called Thanksgiving. And, you know, it's a big family. You go back to your family and you have a big meal, a little bit like Easter and Christmas over in the, uh, the UK. And, you know, I, I thought, well, man, we've relocated a few people here. They may need somewhere to go. So I kind of went around the office and said, look, if you haven't got anywhere to go for Thanksgiving, I want you to come to my house and I'm going to cook for you. And then we ended up with 19 people coming to visit us. <laughs> so I was cooking it for two days, creating it. But just the sense of family we had around the table was incredible. And people just kind of relaxed and got to know each other, which they weren't able to do at work. And having that interpersonal relationships between the staff has been very important to me everywhere we've gone. We had a similar thing at Challenger. Every year in September, we would take our full-time staff, which was, you know, 90 to 100. We'd take them to Las Vegas for a week and we would do educational classes. We'd do new product rollout. We'd do staff reviews. And then we would have just an incredible amount of fun. And just three weeks ago, I went back to Kansas City to the National Soccer Coaches uh, Convention. There were 5,000 coaches there. And we held an evening for alumni, past members of Challenger Sports. Anybody who'd come over and work the Challenger, if you were now a coach at a pro club or a college or whatever, come and have a beer with us. We put, we opened So that's going to be a big bar tub, right? For you. <laughs> it was. And it was probably one of the most rewarding things I've ever seen. You know, hundreds of coaches coming in just saying, thank you. I, I can't believe I started as a little soccer coach in the summer camps who really didn't know what they were doing. And now I'm working at a college, top college, or I'm working with a pro club. And it's absolutely that sense of family 
that we've developed and talking to the full-time staff, most of the conversations would go back to, and do you remember Vegas? Do you remember the time we had there? And it is these memories you create for people who bond together. If all you do is work together, you know, if, if that's it, that's great. You know, and if somebody offers you a bigger paycheck, sometimes you'll jump and you'll go and work for a bigger paycheck. But if you've got these bonds and other attachments, keeping people to a business, that culture is so important. And, and I think very often in business, people overlook that. I think they're, they're too busy making money and selling their products. And Yeah, I think it's got to make it harder to grow a business without without some type of culture that people want to get involved or want to be part of, for sure. A couple more in terms of, like, I'm always interested in in kind of routines, habits, strategies, especially around, like, time management and, and kind of energy management, things like that. Do you have anything that you that you kind of implement to to stay at top? I mean, obviously, living where you live now in Denver, obviously, lovely fresh air every day and, and getting that. But is there anything that you kind of put in put in place to make sure that you're, you're kind of at your best self every, every day or as much as possible? Um, I'm a very early riser. And I like to clear my inbox before I even leave the house. So, you know, I'll watch the news and have a coffee and I, I will get through dozens of emails and, and just prioritize what I've got to work on that day. You know, that that's just habit and I'll never change from that. One thing that I'm, I'm famous for here for moaning at people is I'll check your inbox because your inbox better not have 200 emails in it because they are, it's like your desk. Make sure that you are taking things, you're putting them in a to-do list, you're putting them in tasks, you're putting them in a contacts instead of leaving the email in your inbox because you needed that guy's phone number. So staying organized with technology and especially the comms is very important to me. Gymshark, I don't know if you know, uh, in the UK, built an incredible gym called the Lifting Club. Yeah, I was going to ask if the, is it, have you replicated that over over there yet? Or? Not yet, but this building has fifty six floors in it. On the basement level is a very nice gym, locker room, towel service, the whole thing. So you can pick a time in the day, and it's something I really want to build into our culture when we do get people back from COVID and we're in the office more often is encouraging them to work out instead of somebody feeling they've got to sneak off to, to have a, a workout in the middle of the day. That's a great point because you do feel like some businesses and even working for yourself or not, you think I've got to just nip off and do as quick as I can get back to my desk kind of thing. So yeah, yeah that's going to be really, a really great pull for stuff. No, I, I think the exercise in everybody's lifestyle is massively important and people, a lot of people just don't build it into their time management. They don't build it into their schedule and mm -hmm. that's the reason they don't exercise. It's not because they don't believe in it. It's just that, hey, I'm, I'm too busy. Well, I want to find a way to make it that you're not busy for an hour on a certain day and everybody uh, invests in that. We just actually did complete health screenings for every employee. So we had a medical company come in and we would go in and do all the typical blood pressure, height, weight measurements, and then have blood drawn. And then they come back with this massive, great report on how everybody is as far as your blood sugar and triglycerides, your cholesterol, et cetera, et cetera. And then we provide coaching from this company for each employee to just help them become, live a healthier lifestyle and look at their diet, look at their exercise plans. Yeah, so important. That's a huge advantage. Thanks for spending so much time with me. I've got one last question. It's a bit of a reflective one. If you could go back to pivotal moment, maybe uh, before you left the UK or when you finished university, would it be an early young Peter and giving one piece of advice from your future self? What would you go back and tell yourself? Number one, don't go on blind date. Uh, <laughs> a story I won't tell you about. Oh, that's, yeah, we've uh, run out of time now, luckily. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think at university... I wish I'd been more focused on academia. I would love to have done some studies and research and, and look into things instead of being so focused on sport. Mm -hmm. As a soccer player, I wish I'd have understood raising the level of expectation on yourself and doing extra training and working on your left foot, working on your headers, working on the, the weaker parts of your game outside of the two training sessions that Aylesbury United put on. It just wasn't part of the culture back then. So I, I wish, you know, I could have, I would have loved to have taken my game higher. I played for England at university level, played for Great Britain at university level, but it was just kind of, there wasn't this drive to, to really take the game to the next level. So I wish I'd have done something different then. In the business world, absolutely surround yourself with good people. Hook up with somebody who is brighter than you, who can teach you stuff. Don't think that you no need to know everything. Just have an appetite to learn and to be humble and to work hard and you know the good things will come don't put your ego aside and just learn a business from somebody peter thank you so much for your time i'm sure a lot of that will resonate especially those last comments as well with our listeners so just to say thank in terms of the um show notes we'll get anything linked in there especially we'll try and track down that blind date clip and put that in there for can't find it it's not out there so <laughs> you got it erased yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, all of my every company i've worked at and all of my friends are trying to find it online it's, it's just not there on youtube 
right. <laughs> I appreciate that, Peter. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's show. You can subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can write to us at dryphase.podcast at coordinate.cloud, tweet us at coordinate sport, or follow us on Instagram at coordinate underscore sports, or on my account at james underscore ventures. This episode was produced by Nancy Kwamboka, with support from Claire Goodchild and Lola Small, with special thanks to Rochelle. I'm James Moore, and you've been listening to The Drive Phase from Coordinate Sport.